Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Teresa Ann Beer was only 16 years old when she skipped school on June 1, 1987, to embark on an unusual adventure – a hunt for Bigfoot in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. Teresa's life up to this time had been marked by hardship and abuse. Raised in a turbulent and abusive household, she eventually found herself under the care of her uncle, blind Johnny Richmond, a man with a dark reputation. On that Bigfoot hunting day in June of 1987, her companion was Russell Skip Welch, a 43-year-old Bigfoot enthusiast who also had a troubled past. When Teresa didn't return home that evening, Skip claimed that she had been abducted by the elusive Sasquatch, carried off into the wilderness, never to be seen again. When she vanished, it sparked widespread suspicion, but no one was ever prosecuted for her disappearance. Skip's bizarre and inconsistent stories only deepened the mystery, leading many to believe that he was the one truly responsible for Teresa's fate. Yet even with the most sinister suspicions, the truth behind what happened to Teresa Ann Beer remained an enigma, leaving a haunting question. Was she really taken by Bigfoot, or was she a victim of something far more human and far more sinister? Despite extensive searches and investigations, no trace of Teresa was ever found, and her disappearance remains a chilling mystery to this day. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… In the early 1980s, Australia became a hotspot for extraordinary UFO sightings and alien encounters, rivaling those reported in the United States and Europe. From mysterious orange orbs flying in formation to shape-shifting spacecraft and enigmatic beings, these lesser-known incidents suggest that the land down under may hold a special significance for extraterrestrial visitors. Could Australia's unique geography and vast, uninhabited areas be the key to unlocking the secrets of an alien presence on Earth? From 1953 to 1973, the CIA conducted a top-secret mind-control program known as Project MKUltra, pushing the boundaries of ethics and legality in the name of national security. Using LSD, hypnosis, and even torture, the agency experimented on unwitting citizens and its own personnel, leaving a trail of controversy and damaged lives in its wake. Decades later, the full extent of MKUltra's operations remains shrouded in mystery, with only fragments of its dark history coming to light through declassified documents and survivor testimonies. From frozen bodies in abandoned buildings to mummified remains in chimneys, there have been numerous chilling discoveries where human remains have been found in the most unexpected places. It's just one way people, either by accident or sinister misdeeds, can simply vanish without a trace. But in a few cases, the bodies do turn up, in bizarre ways and strange locations. But first, in 1987, 16-year-old Teresa Ann Beer vanished during a Bigfoot hunting trip. Her fellow hiker, Hunter, claimed Teresa was abducted by Sasquatch, but authorities suspected foul play. Decades later, Teresa remains missing. We begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, 
listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. On June 1, 1987, 16-year-old Teresa Ann Beer skipped school and went on a Bigfoot hunt in the Sierra Nevada mountains of California. She never came home. According to the 43-year-old Bigfoot enthusiast that she went into the woods with, she was kidnapped by Bigfoot, who carried her off into the wilderness never to be seen again. To this day, Teresa has never been found, and no one has ever been prosecuted for her disappearance. Teresa had a rough childhood. She grew up in a turbulent Fresno, California home with her siblings and her abusive parents, Shirley and David Beer. Once, when Teresa was three, she had to be taken to the hospital after her mother wrapped one of her legs around one of the slats in her crib and twisted it until it broke. It's not surprising that social services removed Teresa and her siblings from their parents' care and put them in foster homes. A few years later, Teresa's father decided that he wanted custody of his daughter back. He had divorced Shirley and remarried Margie Richmond, who had previously been married to Shirley's half-brother, John Richmond. She had two daughters who lived with her and David. David was granted custody, and the family moved to Southern California, where Margie was reportedly abusive to both Teresa and her own daughters. Teresa fled to her great-grandmother's house in Fresno, and although David initially tried to get her to come home, she refused, and he soon lost interest. Not long after she returned to Fresno, Teresa's uncle, John Richmond, showed interest in raising his teenage niece and was granted custody. John, who was known by the nickname Blind Johnny, was 42 years old and claimed that he had lost his eyesight while playing Russian roulette, but most people believed that he was not completely blind. His daughters lived with his ex-wife Margie, but he had two sons from another woman. He also had a 17-year-old girlfriend, Tamara Newman, who lived with him. Teresa's home life was no better here. Johnny often made her miss school so she could babysit and, most disturbingly, but not surprisingly, Johnny and his friends abused her sexually. As a result, Teresa did poorly in school. She was described by teachers as a slow learner and immature. Just after Memorial Day weekend in 1987, Teresa told her friends Peggy and Janice that she was going into the mountains with a guy she recently met and that she would likely miss a day of school. The guy she'd met was Russell Shelton Welch, better known as Skip. He was 43 years old and a house painter who mostly lived off disability checks. His wife Shannon had died a few years before from a drug overdose, and his own addiction to meth was worsened by his grief. Skip was known for his talkative personality and colorful stories, and for his obsession with Bigfoot, the creature also known as Sasquatch, which was believed to inhabit the forest of the Northwest. Skip claimed that he had seen Bigfoot many times. On the morning of June 1st, Skip stopped by Johnny's house, the two were acquaintances, and while there noticed Teresa getting ready for school. He offered to give her a ride. In hindsight, we know this was a ruse for her uncle's sake. Teresa had already told friends that she planned to skip school and spend the day with Skip in the mountains. Later that morning, Johnny received a call from Central High School asking about Teresa's absence. Not wanting to deal with the situation, he just said she was sick. But he later claimed he was bothered by the fact that she was missing and started calling around to find her. He spoke to several acquaintances, and while none of them knew where she was, most warned him that Skip was not a trustworthy person. Finally that evening, Johnny reported Teresa missing to the Fresno police. They began an immediate search, speaking to some of Skip's friends, one of whom was Michelle Ryan. The 17-year-old had been lured to the Sierra Nevadas by Skip the previous summer, she was also fascinated with Bigfoot and loved his stories. Skip's own daughter, Chandra, had advised against Michelle going with him. 
She knew her father had a habit of taking girls into the mountains, offering them drugs and having sex with them. Michelle took two friends with her, and she made it home safe. Police also spoke to Chandra and Skip's son, Terry. Both said they had seen their father and Teresa on the day of the girl's disappearance. Regardless, Skip and Teresa were nowhere to be found. Four days after they left for the mountains, a police officer spotted Skip's brown 1976 Monte Carlo by a trailer park near North Fork, a town in the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas near Shut Eye Peak. It was later explained that Skip had come down from the mountain to visit a friend, Dorothy Davis. He was very upset, she later reported, and told her about a young girl that had been taken by a satanic group and was being held captive in the mountains. Dorothy said that he was high at the time and assumed he was delusional. Skip wasn't found until June 11th, when he was picked up at his mother's house in Fresno on a previous drunk driving violation. During questioning, he spoke very seriously about Bigfoot and claimed that there was a large community of them living in the mountains. They stayed hidden because of their superhuman intelligence, and they lived in underground caves. Despite the secrecy, Skip claimed that he had had contact with them many times. His story about Teresa was just as convoluted, and it changed several times. At first, he claimed to have dropped her off at school, as he had promised her uncle he would do, but then he admitted that yes, they had gone to the Sierra Nevadas. He also claimed that she had run off into the woods with another young woman and then changed that to a group of other campers. In another version, he said that Teresa had gotten overly excited when they spotted a Bigfoot and had run off to find the creature again. He searched for her everywhere but couldn't find her, he said. He was convinced the Bigfoot had taken her away to live with them. Skip insisted that Teresa would not be returning because she'd be happier with the community of Sasquatches in the mountains rather than at her troubled home. And one more thing, Skip added without being asked, if they did find Teresa, they wouldn't find any signs of sexual abuse. Not from him. He claimed that although Teresa had been willing to have a sexual relationship with him, he would never have done that with a young girl. He didn't do things like that, he said. A search near Shut Eye Peak revealed the place where Skip and Teresa had camped. They also found what was believed to be Teresa's purse and some of her clothing. Infrared helicopter searches took place and dogs were brought in to hunt for the missing girl. They managed to pick up Teresa's scent once, but no other clues were found. Most believe that Skip killed Teresa and disposed of her body. Others, including Skip's family, believed she was abducted and possibly killed by someone else. Even though Chandra admitted that her father was a predator at the time of Teresa's disappearance, she now claims that her father's only crime was practicing bad judgment by taking a young girl into the mountains. No one believed that she was kidnapped by Bigfoot. Skip was charged with child endangerment and child abduction. He was arraigned and released on bail. Three days before his trial, the prosecution dropped the charges, promising that Skip would face a murder prosecution if Teresa was ever found. But Skip will never face those charges. He died in 1998 at the age of 54 from severe coronary artery disease. Teresa Ann Beer has never been seen again. Up next on Weird Darkness, in the early 1980s, Australia became a hotspot for extraordinary UFO sightings and alien encounters, rivaling those reported in the United States and Europe. From mysterious orange orbs flying in formation to shape-shifting spacecraft and enigmatic beings, these lesser-known incidents suggest that the land down under may hold a special significance for extraterrestrial visitors.
If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Australia has witnessed numerous UFO sightings and encounters involving peculiar beings over the years. Yet several lesser-known incidents from the early 1980s remain obscure, even among individuals within the UFO community. Many of these occurrences share similarities with encounters reported worldwide, some of which date back decades. It is conceivable that this particular region may hold undisclosed significance for the purported alien entities. From sightings of anomalous lights in the sky to reports of colossal mothership-like craft deploying smaller vehicles into the atmosphere, as well as encounters with enigmatic beings and potential instances of alien abductions, the level of UFO and extraterrestrial activity in Australia during the early 1980s rivaled that experienced in other parts of the world, such as the United States and Europe. One could posit that a common, enigmatic alien presence might be responsible for these geographically distant encounters across the globe. Around 11 p.m. on July 8, 1981, in Hindmarsh, Adelaide, an unnamed builder's laborer was watching television at a hostel with another resident. Most of the other 40 residents were asleep in their rooms, unaware of the impending events. While watching TV, they noticed the hostile caretaker heading towards the front door to step outside for a cigarette. Shortly after he left, he quickly returned, his face displaying a mix of fear and excitement. He exclaimed to the pair that it seemed like Armageddon or something and urged them to accompany him outside. Despite the cold winter evening, the pair followed him. Upon stepping out, they immediately spotted six round, orange, glowing balls in the night sky. These objects appeared to be moving from the Adelaide Hills towards the ocean. The witness estimated they were flying at a height of just under a thousand feet and were traveling in a formation, led by one with the rest following closely in a zigzag pattern. Despite the witness's knowledge of aviation, he was surprised that he could not hear any sound from the objects, which were moving at a considerable speed. Additionally, it was evident that the objects had no visible landing lights and maintained a perfectly straight path without any change in altitude. The witness, along with others in the area, recognized that what they were witnessing was certainly beyond the realm of regular air traffic that typically passed overhead. The three witnesses conversed quietly among themselves, trying to come up with explanations for the phenomenon before them. They observed that the objects were moving in a straight zigzag trajectory, but with a peculiar diagonal motion. What's more, each object exhibited pulsating movements, seemingly expanding in size or luminosity in a sequential and independent manner. For a few moments, they watched as the objects continued their journey, eventually disappearing beyond the expanse of the ocean. As the objects accelerated and vanished from view, the witnesses stood mesmerized by the extraordinary events they had just experienced. They began to wonder how numerous aerial entities of uncertain identity could navigate Australian airspace undetected and without eliciting any response. The absence of conventional aviation lights led them to theorize that these entities might be clandestine aircraft from a foreign power 
or something entirely different, potentially originating from beyond our world. According to a report submitted by the National UFO Reporting Center, a captivating incident occurred the following year in Brisbane. On the evening of April 20, 1982, around 8 p.m., an unidentified woman and her partner were at her apartment when they suddenly perceived an unusual vibration emanating from above. Accustomed to the sounds of airplanes landing at Brisbane Airport, as they lived on the top floor directly in the flight path, this particular occurrence stood out distinctly. Sensing that something extraordinary was happening, they proceeded to the living room window. Peering outside, they observed an intensely luminous object approaching their apartment, resembling burning magnesium, radiating a brilliant blue-white hue and intermittently pulsating. The object traversed over the top of their building as they closely monitored its movement through the sky until it halted above the southern part of the city. Remarkably high in the sky at this point, the light abruptly extinguished and re-illuminated in a completely different location, a sequence that recurred several times. Their observation of the object persisted for approximately 90 minutes, culminating in its division into two distinct entities just before vanishing entirely. Each of the two objects exhibited a blinking pattern with colors transitioning sporadically, accompanied by what appeared to be flares emitting diverse hues. Several moments later, the two objects recombined into a singular entity. Shortly thereafter, the unit split once more, this time dividing into four distinct objects, each emitting flares into the night sky as their predecessors had done. After a brief interval, all four objects merged back into a unified form. In the ensuing moment, it proceeded toward the western desert. About 30 minutes later, unable to sleep due to the recent spectacle, the witness ventured outside. To her surprise, she observed a sudden emergence of bright lights in the same section of the sky where the initial object had vanished. These lights approached her direction, passing directly over her location and above her dwelling. It became apparent to her that the source of these lights belonged to military helicopters, a highly unusual occurrence. Even more peculiarly, a few moments after the helicopters disappeared, regular air traffic resumed. When the witness inquired with the airport the next day regarding any disruptions to air travel the previous night, they adamantly refuted any such incidents, asserting that air traffic had operated normally throughout the evening. Although clueless about the nature of the object, both witnesses were convinced of its non-human origin and presumed it to be a product of sophisticated extraterrestrial technology. Perhaps of additional interest is the observation that no aircraft landed at the airport during the sighting, a departure from the usual pattern of planes landing every 15 minutes. This leads to speculation about a potential grounding of aircraft by a higher authority, raising the question of the involvement of top-secret government technology. It raises the possibility that the unidentified intelligence associated with the strange, luminous object may have influenced the delay or diversion of incoming flights. Alternatively, it could simply be a coincidence. There are also various lesser-known accounts of anomalous objects in Australia in the months and years following the incident. For instance, shortly after the Brisbane encounter, in the early hours of June 30, 1982, a young boy observed a large, circular spacecraft descending into his family's backyard on the Gold Coast before quickly ascending back into the sky. The subsequent year in Dunmore, New South Wales witnessed another peculiar sighting. On the evening of June 30, 1983, the witness and two companions at a 200-acre property noticed a brilliantly cut diamond-shaped object with its point removed at a distance, featuring a top section divided by lights and emitting no sound. The group observed the object for a minute or two, witnessing its sudden acceleration towards them then followed by an abrupt halt. While uncertain of the exact distance the object traversed, the witness recollected its transformation from the size of a full moon to five times that in an instant. Remaining suspended in the air, completely soundless and directly above them, the object captivated their gaze. Subsequently, three smaller crafts emerged from its underside, swiftly maneuvering in various directions resembling luminous spheres. Although unable to recall the hues of the object, 
The witness distinctly noted two of the crafts sharing the same color while the third displayed a contrasting shade. During their majestic dance across the nocturnal expanse, the diamond-shaped mothership maintained its stationary position, serene and noiseless. This spectacle unfolded for an extended duration, with one witness growing so accustomed to the display that boredom crept in. Following a period of time, the smaller crafts gradually vanished into the obsidian sky. Suddenly, the diamond-shaped craft swiftly returned to its previous location in the distance, surpassing its prior speed as it receded until it resembled a distant star in the night sky. At this juncture, an aircraft materialized in the sky, swiftly followed by three smaller luminous objects. Despite maintaining a distance, they seemed to trail the plane. Simultaneously, the trio of witnesses could discern the diamond-shaped entity in the distance. Subsequent to the aircraft vanishing into the horizon, the diamond-shaped object swiftly returned to the spot where the witnesses were stationed, again exhibiting remarkable speed. Shortly after, the three smaller objects re-entered the larger craft, which promptly sped off into the distance and vanished. Curiously, upon the primary witness's return home and recounting the sighting to her mother, she mentioned that at around the same time, the television reception within the household had abruptly turned snowy, persisting for nearly an hour. It is also noteworthy to mention that the object's description closely resembles that of the Cash Landrum incident that transpired in the United States merely three years prior. Several weeks passed before another captivating incident occurred, approximately at 7.30 p.m. on September 7th in Sydney. On that particular evening, a young mother residing in a modest apartment with her two-year-old son who was engrossed in playing with his toys in the hallway found herself involved in a mysterious encounter. A sudden knock disrupted the tranquility of her home as she sat watching television. Upon answering the door, she encountered her friend who inquired if she could take the young boy along to the laundry room. Moments later, as she stepped out, the hallway and the entire apartment plunged into darkness, yet the television continued to cast its glow, baffling the witness. She dismissed the power outage as a mere issue with the utility company. However, an inexplicable urge prompted her to gaze out of the window. Almost as if compelled by an unseen force, she found herself facing a peculiar sight. Six intensely luminous lights, five arranged in a circular pattern, with the sixth positioned within the circle near the lower left side. She observed the peculiar sight for approximately five or six seconds before the illumination in the circle dimmed. Upon extinguishing, the light within it swiftly traversed the sky. Pausing briefly, it eventually retraced its path to its original position. Soon after, it repeated this maneuver, dashing to the center of the sky before returning to its previous location. This time, however, the luminous circular arrangement reappeared around it, precisely as it had been before. The witness noted in her statement that she recognized she was beholding something otherworldly, primarily due to the extensive distance the lights had traveled. The true identity of the object remains a mystery. When her companion returned from the laundry approximately an hour later, the lights had resumed their usual appearance. A more peculiar incident unfolded the following year near Perth around midnight on January 6, 1984. On that specific evening, the observer was walking her dog near a nearby lake. Upon reaching a clearing, she noticed figures in the distance approaching her. While still quite a distance away, the observer initially believed them to be a group of young individuals. However, she also discerned an unusual white light, which she presumed to be caused by white jeans reflecting the moonlight. Realizing suddenly, apart from her dog, she was entirely alone, the observer stood in darkness opting to remain concealed until the group had passed by. From an analysis of several accounts, it is evident that UFO and alien phenomena in Australia parallel encounters reported in various locations globally. This alignment, though not unexpected, offers further indications that the alien influence on Earth is indeed widespread, if not universal in scope. While specific areas exhibit heightened activity, it appears that the entire planet holds allure and relevance for these enigmatic visitors. Could Australia itself hold greater significance for this apparent alien civilization than commonly perceived? Its geographic positioning could be deemed advantageous. 
Considering the statistic that more than half of UFO sightings occur over or near bodies of water, coupled with assertions of extraterrestrial bases beneath many of the world's oceans, Australia's island status amidst vast waters suddenly becomes intriguing. Moreover, the expansive outback provides ample opportunity for establishing covert terrestrial installations. Australia, therefore, may emerge as a pivotal site for unraveling the mysteries surrounding UFO and alien phenomena. One must also contemplate the motives behind this purported alien presence. Do these visitors from beyond our world observe us solely as spectators? If so, why has this pervasive surveillance endured for decades? The prevalence of alien abduction incidents over the years suggests that this presence may not necessarily be benevolent towards humanity. Given the extent of their influence, it is plausible that they have covertly infiltrated the planet without detection, perpetuating their undisclosed and unchallenged agenda. Coming up, from frozen bodies in abandoned buildings to mummified remains in chimneys, there have been numerous chilling discoveries where human remains have been found in the most unexpected places. It's just one way people, either by accident or sinister misdeeds, can simply vanish without a trace. But in a few cases, the bodies do turn up, in bizarre ways and strange locations. That story is up next when Weird Darkness returns. To what lengths will someone go in order to survive? Does the survival instinct override their conscience and allow them to commit not only murder but also the taboo act of cannibalism? What happens when a person crosses the line from dark fantasy to real-life acts of brutal rape, murder, and cannibalism? Are these people driven by a desire so insatiable that they're incapable of controlling it? Murderous Minds Volume 3 – Stories of Real-Life Murderers That Escape the Headlines is the latest offering in a series that takes you inside the lives of killers who committed cold-blooded murder for a glimpse at events that drove them to kill. Authored within a historical context, each chapter is an unbelievable venture inside the dark and twisted world of real cannibal killers whose names and crimes might not be familiar to you. By weaving a tale in which dark fantasies become reality, this audiobook invites you to see life from a perspective few ever witness, from that of the killer. Along with a historical look at cannibalism through the ages, these stories beg the listener to answer the question, was the murderer committing cannibalism because he was incapable of resisting the urge to kill and consume, or is the explanation simply pure evil? Murderous Minds, Volume 3, written by Ryan Becker and Curtis Giles Vasey, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Several instances have occurred where bodies have been discovered in unusual locations, often remaining undiscovered for extended periods, ranging from months to years. Bodies have been found in various places such as chimneys, elevator shafts, concealed behind a supermarket cooler, and even within haunted house attractions during Halloween. In January 2009, Authorities in Detroit recovered the deceased body of a man frozen within ice in the elevator shaft of a vacant former Detroit Public Schools book repository. Investigators estimated the body had been in that location for several months, although the man's identity and cause of death remain unknown. Ford Motor Company acquired the Roosevelt's Warehouse and the derelict Michigan Central Depot situated on Detroit's west side. Positioned near 14th Street and Michigan Avenue, 
The depot succumbed to a fire in 1987, resulting in the loss of resources intended for numerous Detroit children. The property was later purchased by Matty Morone, a prominent figure in trucking and real estate and the primary private property holder in Michigan. Many homeless individuals resided within the warehouse, at a time when approximately 19,000 homeless individuals were estimated to be living on Detroit's streets, translating to about one in 50 people. The narrative commences with a phone call placed by an individual to a journalist, reporting the discovery of a deceased body in the elevator shaft. The caller's acquaintance, an urban explorer navigating Detroit's ruins, stumbled upon the body. In January 2019, while engaged in a game of hockey with fellow explorers on the frozen water that collected within the old Roosevelt Building's basement, the body in the elevator was sighted. Despite this discovery, none of the individuals contacted the authorities and proceeded with their hockey game. When the unknown caller described the situation, they mentioned, he's encased in ice, with only his legs protruding like popsicle sticks. The reason given for not contacting the police by the caller was that the individual did not want to face legal consequences due to trespassing. Harley Dilly, a 14-year-old adolescent, vanished under enigmatic circumstances shortly after departing for school in Port Clinton, Ohio, on December 20, 2019. According to Harley's missing person flyer, he was born on August 12, 2005, and identified as a Caucasian male with brown hair and green eyes. Furthermore, he stood 4 feet 9 inches tall and weighed 100 pounds. His parents, Heather and Marcus Dilly, resided with him. Additionally, his mobile phone had been damaged while at the residence prior to his departure. In an update, dated December 31, 2019, the Port Clinton authorities conveyed that Harley's family had provided complete cooperation, indicating no suspicions of their involvement. Subsequently, they stated, "...our investigators are diligently examining the available records we have thus far acquired." The ongoing probe involves collaboration from federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies. Detective Ronald Timmons of the Port Clinton Police revealed that surveillance footage captured an individual believed to be Harley crossing the street in front of his residence at 6.08 a.m. on December 20th, marking his final known sighting. Harley's remains were ultimately discovered inside a chimney within an unoccupied residence situated across the street from his family's home. Adjacent to his body were his glasses and red puffer jacket on the second floor. Perplexingly, the motive behind Harley's entry into the chimney of a residence owned by another family remains unclear. The chimney's passage had been obstructed between the first and second floors, inadvertently confining Harley. The dimensions of the chimney measured approximately 9 inches by 13 inches, and the residents belonging to a family currently undertaking remodeling projects had served as a summer home. For several weeks, there was a coordinated community endeavor to locate Dilly, which included establishing a reward fund from various community contributions. Nevertheless, during this period, there were also swirling rumors on the internet, prompting Chief Robert Hickman to repeatedly urge people to refrain from sharing them. Chief Robert Hickman informed the press, the residence has been thoroughly checked on multiple occasions. There was no indication that anyone was inside the house. This was due to the house being securely deadbolted, locked, and equipped with a lockbox. Subsequently, on January 13, authorities opted to conduct another search of Harley's neighborhood, ultimately leading them back to the unoccupied house, which they decided to re-enter. Following the search of the house, Chief Robert Hickman relayed, we were able to locate what we believe to be Harley, who was found trapped in the chimney. His family was notified early this morning, and this incident appears to be accidental. No evidence of foul play is currently suspected. It was determined that he had ascended an antenna tower onto the roof and entered the chimney. On January 11, 2013, the remains of a young male were discovered within a vertically rolled up mat in the gymnasium of Lowndes High School in Valdosta, Georgia. The deceased individual was identified as 18-year-old Kendrick Johnson, a student at the high school. A preliminary examination and post-mortem evaluation concluded that the death was accidental. Law enforcement authorities described it as a tragic accident, stating that he asphyxiated inside an upright gym mat after inadvertently falling in headfirst while trying to retrieve a shoe. Johnson's family hired a private pathologist to conduct a second autopsy, 
the results of which indicated that Johnson had actually died from blunt force trauma. On October 31, 2013, the U.S. Attorney for the Middle District of Georgia announced the initiation of a formal review into Johnson's death. Subsequently, on June 20, 2016, the U.S. Department of Justice, the DOJ, announced its decision not to pursue any criminal charges in connection to Johnson's death. In response, Kendrick's family filed a civil lawsuit amounting to $100 million against 38 individuals. This lawsuit alleged that Johnson's death was a murder, implicating the respondents in a conspiracy to conceal the homicide, allegedly involving two sons of an FBI agent. However, the lawsuit was later retracted. Following this development, Georgia Judge Richard Porter ordered the Johnsons and their legal representative to pay over $292,000 in legal fees to the defendants. The judge accused the Johnsons and their attorney of manufacturing evidence to substantiate their assertions. Another prominent case involves Elisa Lamb and the Cecil Hotel. On February 19, 2013, a body was found in a water tank situated on the roof of the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles. The body was identified as Elisa Lam, or Lam Ho Yi, a Canadian student enrolled at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. Lam had been reported missing at the beginning of February 2013. The body was discovered by maintenance staff at the hotel while investigating guest complaints regarding water supply issues, low water pressure, and an odd taste. Her body was unclothed, surrounded by her garments and personal belongings adrift in the water nearby. This next entry involves an event that gained such widespread popularity that for the third consecutive year, local law enforcement had to erect barriers to maintain a smooth flow of both vehicular and pedestrian traffic. The Grahams initiated the advanced sale of event tickets as a method of monitoring attendance. In 2014, recounted Hank Graham, proprietor of the wicked Waukegan Haunted House, we became aware of a discrepancy when the count of tickets was one short upon tallying the receipts at day's end. This transpired during one of the initial evenings of the attraction early last month. The puzzle of the erroneous ticket count was unraveled when a six-year-old guest confided in his parents that he had been greatly frightened by the old, decaying, odorous man on the upper level. I overheard the young boy's remark, shared Hank, and I thought to myself, Oh dear, if children are experiencing a fright, it adds to the overall thrill. Year after year, we introduce new decorations, including mummies, skeletons, and mannequins, along with classic crowd-pleasers like peeled grapes masquerading as eyeballs in a bowl, strobe lights, and fog machines. Regrettably, the cause of the boy's fright was not one of our props. On that very same night, 31-year-old Susan Johnston let out a scream when her children, whom she was escorting through the attraction, unintentionally bumped into what they believed was a prop dummy, only to realize it was an actual deceased person. I cautioned them to exercise caution as we proceeded, however my young Grace inadvertently made contact with him which caused him to stumble, resulting in his arm being forcibly torn from his body. Blood and various bodily fluids splattered onto Grace's jacket and hair, while my son Ricky found himself covered in an unknown slimy substance. Both children were overwhelmed with fear. Upon our initial entry, a putrid odor permeated the air, but we dismissed it as part of the attraction. Subsequently, both my children regrettably vomited on the floor. Upon investigation by the authorities, it was revealed that a 71-year-old man had leaned against a building corner on the second floor and had tragically passed away. Officer Allison Garfield commented, The cause of his demise is yet undetermined, whether it was a heart attack or an underlying ailment. The chaotic aftermath of the discovery, though, led to people fleeing the premises in distress, contrary to the expected reaction at such an establishment. Reflecting on the isolated nature of the deceased individual, Lynn Graham lamented to imagine someone living in utter solitude, unnoticed for weeks on end, and embarking on a solo excursion for amusement, we failed to observe his presence. It's truly distressing. With the abundance of props in that area, I assumed Hank had placed him there, while he assumed I had. The local health department closed down the Halloween display, however authorities chose not to press charges against the Graham family. Officer Garfield stated, It was simply an unfortunate incident. They are truly kind individuals who generously open their home each year for others to enjoy themselves, and this incident has cast a shadow over the entire event. 
In a separate incident from 2017, a haunted house in Waterville, Maine was shut down by law enforcement after it was revealed that the owners, Maureen and Carl Taylor, were incorporating real deceased individuals in their exhibits. Despite having operated the haunted house for more than a decade, visitors that year expressed feelings of unease. Patron Mary Clark recounted, "...as I toured through, I noticed a strange odor, which I assumed was from the fog machines or something similar. Those machines can emit quite unpleasant scents sometimes. But as I progressed further, the odor intensified, only to realize there were no fog machines. I casually passed by what I initially mistook for a prop cadaver, yet upon closer inspection I observed maggots emerging from the eye sockets. I was on the verge of shrieking." The tailors declared they were clueless as to how the deceased individuals ended up within their displays, given that they had been utilizing the same commercially acquired props for the past decade. Law enforcement confirmed no break-ins at the local morgue or disruptions during any ceremonies. It remains a true enigma, as these bodies seemingly materialized out of thin air, commented Police Chief Christopher Davis. It is an exceedingly disconcerting situation. Last I verified, deceased individuals do not autonomously rise up and depart on their own. Police clarified that the Taylors were not considered suspects in any cadaver tampering incidents. However, they faced charges of criminal neglect for allowing individuals unaware of the situation to come into such close proximity to deceased bodies. In 2009, Larry Ellie Maria Masada, a 25-year-old from Council Bluffs, Iowa, disappeared while employed at a local supermarket. A decade later, laborers discovered a severely decomposed body trapped between a 12-foot-high cooler and a wall, with just an 18-inch gap separating them. The unfortunate incident led to Larry's demise, and the decomposing body had been present for weeks, emanating an odor noticeably to supermarket patrons. Was this a strange accident or something more peculiar at the No Frills supermarket in Council Bluffs, Iowa? Gareth Wynne Williams, a 32-year-old Welsh mathematician, cycling enthusiast, art aficionado, elite codebreaker, and intelligence officer with the UK's Secret Services, garnered attention. On Monday, August 23, 2010, police discovered Gareth's naked, decomposed remains in a red North Face bag secured with a padlock on the exterior, situated in the ensuite bathroom of the main bedroom on the top floor of his flat in Alderney Street, of the main bedroom on the top floor of his flat in Alderney Street, Pimlico, London. Subsequent peculiarities unfolded during the investigation, prompting numerous theories to be postulated regarding the circumstances surrounding Gareth's demise. Following a 2012 inquest into his death, the coroner concluded that William's demise was unnatural and likely to have resulted from criminal meddling, expressing certainty beyond reasonable doubt that Gareth was unlawfully killed. However, a subsequent police reinvestigation challenged these findings. The question remains, was Gareth's demise truly suicide, a tragic misadventure, or something more nefarious involving counter-espionage by Russian operatives? When Weird Darkness Returns From 1953 to 1973, the CIA conducted a top-secret mind control program known as Project MKUltra, pushing the boundaries of ethics and legality in the name of national security. Using LSD, hypnosis, and even torture, the agency experimented on unwitting citizens and its own personnel, leaving a trail of controversy and damaged lives in its wake. Decades later, the full extent of MKUltra's operations remains shrouded in mystery, with only fragments of its dark history coming to light through declassified documents and survivor testimonies. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee 
coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Numerous conspiracy theories exist regarding the CIA, with a particular focus on CIA mind control. However, concerning Project MKUltra, these conspiracy theories are surprisingly accurate. Rather than relying solely on hearsay and rumors, there are still living MKUltra survivors willing to share their experiences, along with heavily redacted documents that partially outline the program's experiments. MKUltra, a CIA initiative that operated from 1953 to 1973, sought to manipulate minds by employing substances such as LSD and other drugs to extract information during interrogations. The history of the program is as outrageous as the experiments themselves, yet the most astonishing aspect is that such activities persisted unchecked for such an extended period. Even after the public became aware of Project MKUltra, and it was eventually discontinued, the individuals involved faced minimal repercussions. The project aimed to develop a capability in the covert use of biological and chemical materials, but the methods employed by the CIA have been widely criticized as unethical and contentious by both the public and other government entities. The true number of fatalities resulting from MKUltra remains uncertain, with only a single death definitively confirmed. Frank Olson, a U.S. Army biochemist, unknowingly ingested LSD as part of the project. While other government personnel involved in the experiment recovered from its effects, Olson tragically did not. Suffering a psychotic episode induced by the LSD, he was closely monitored but ultimately met his demise after falling from his 10th-story hotel window, despite being under the care of CIA doctors at the time. Amidst a backdrop of conspiracy theories, Olson's family asserts that he was murdered, yet the undeniable link to his death lies in Project MKUltra. This incident was one of several fatalities associated with the project. Project MKUltra is rife with scandalous episodes, perhaps none more sensational than Operation Midnight Climax, a clandestine endeavor within the broader CIA Mind Control Initiative. Under this operation, sex workers were engaged to entice clients back to a CIA-operated location where they would be surreptitiously drugged. Agents monitored these drug-induced encounters through one-way mirrors, meticulously documenting the proceedings while savoring non-spiked martinis. The safe houses reportedly featured imagery depicting women in bondage on their walls. CIA operatives were not the only individuals susceptible to covert LSD exposure. Illegally, agents would administer hallucinogens to random individuals in bars and public settings, discreetly shadowing them to observe the effects. Such unauthorized experimentation violated multiple laws and posed significant risks. The eventual destruction of MKUltra documentation ensures the public will remain unaware of the number of people innocently embarking on psychedelic experiences after a routine night out. All reputable conspiracy theories involve Nazis in some capacity, and the factual account of Project MKUltra is no exception. The introduction of LSD to American intelligence was credited to Nazi scientists assimilated into the U.S. under Project Paperclip. These scientists disclosed information on a substance with purported military applications, supposedly in development by Swiss researchers. This substance was LSD, prompting the CIA to explore its potential military uses. While the primary focus of Project MKUltra lay in leveraging LSD for mind control and indoctrination, diverse methods were experimented with. In addition to LSD, the CIA probed hypnosis, sensory deprivation, and other strategies aimed at refining interrogation techniques. Among these methods was overtly illegal torture, carried out on subjects as part of MKUltra's pursuit to demystify the complexities of the human psyche. When the CIA contracted its experiments to academic institutions and medical facilities, 
the participants were at least notified of their involvement in a psychological study. However, other individuals subjected to MKUltra were not as fortunate. The CIA frequently administered LSD and various other substances without prior disclosure in order to observe their unfiltered reactions. In some instances, even fellow CIA agents served as unwitting victims. At communal gatherings, unsuspecting participants would receive altered beverages or sandwiches, only learning of the additional substances consumed after ingestion. This created an undoubtedly tense professional atmosphere. Ted Kaczynski, also known as the Unabomber, stands out as one of the most notorious domestic terrorists in American history. Initially a promising mathematics student at Harvard, Kaczynski's path took a dark turn when he developed an intense animosity towards modern science and technology, driving him to take action. Many believe that a pivotal moment in Kaczynski's life was a lengthy study he participated in while at Harvard. At the age of 17, Kaczynski volunteered for a psychological research project overseen by Dr. Henry Murray, a professor with covert ties to the CIA. The experiment reportedly entailed substantial emotional and psychological mistreatment, including verbal abuse, humiliation, and the degradation of values and beliefs. While it remains uncertain whether these experiments were linked to MKUltra, speculation abounds regarding potential connections. Ken Kesey, the author of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, participated in an LSD experiment as part of Project MKUltra at Stanford University, developing a strong affinity for the substance. Alongside Kesey, other individuals reportedly involved included Robert Hunter of the Grateful Dead, a band closely associated with the psychedelic movement, and the notorious Boston gangster Whitey Bulger. Sidney Gottlieb oversaw Project MKUltra for the CIA, delegating some tasks to subordinates, such as George Hunter White, who managed Operation Midnight Climax. In a memo to Gottlieb, White shared his unorthodox perspective on the ethical dilemmas of the program, expressing his enthusiastic engagement with activities that would typically be considered taboo. In 1953, White, using the alias Morgan Hall, rented an apartment in Greenwich Village, New York. He would entice individuals to his residence, administer LSD to them, at times without their consent, in order to observe the effects of the drug on their behavior. Very few individuals from any time period would willingly volunteer for CIA experimentation. Consequently, the CIA relied on various organizations to serve as fronts for conducting their MKUltra experiments. Colleges, universities, hospitals, prisons, and pharmaceutical companies were all clandestinely involved in CIA-funded experiments relating to mind control, all while keeping the subjects uninformed about the true nature of the experiments. These institutions were often persuaded to participate through bribery, facilitated by the CIA's significant funding during the height of the Cold War. The complete extent and magnitude of Project MKUltra will likely remain concealed. In 1973, amidst scrutiny from Gerald Ford and Congress, CIA Director Richard Helms commanded that a majority of the MKUltra files be destroyed to conceal the project. Some documents survived and were later discovered in 1977, yet they only revealed a fraction of the experiments carried out by the CIA over the course of the program's two decades. Helms faced little consequence for his actions, transitioning to become the U.S. ambassador to Iran after leaving his role as director. Since the exposure of Project MKUltra, the CIA has skillfully evaded legal accountability for their often appalling deeds. Judicial protections shield the CIA from direct culpability, and the institutions involved in MKUltra were mandated to safeguard intelligence sources. Government employees were prohibited from initiating lawsuits due to being unknowingly subjected to dosing, although a few did attempt to do so. Several compensation settlements have been granted, notably including a $750,000 payment to Frank Olson's family, facilitated through legislative acts or alternative approaches that circumvented legal accountability. Notably, certain Canadian victims of MKUltra's dosing experiments have received compensation through extrajudicial agreements believed to be aimed at deflecting responsibility. 
The genesis of Project MKUltra can be traced back to CIA officials who were inspired after observing the trial of Joseph Cardinal Menzenti in Budapest at the hands of the Soviets in 1949. The defendant, appearing disoriented, led the agents to suspect that his confession was induced through drug-related manipulation or Soviet hypnosis. This spurred a dedicated initiative to address the brainwashing gap during the Cold War, culminating in the establishment of MKUltra. John Mulholland underwent extensive training under the tutelage of the Society of American Magicians President John William Sargent, enhancing his prowess in the art of magic. Establishing a rapport with Harry Houdini, both men were recruited by government agencies for espionage assignments. While Houdini conducted surveillance on the Russian and German military for Scotland Yard, Mulholland assisted the CIA, providing insights to MKUltra operatives on the surreptitious administration of LSD. In addition to his operational support, Mulholland was remunerated for his contribution to an espionage manual for the agency, titled The Manual of Trickery and Deception. This publication not only guides MKUltra members on giving covert signals, but also instructs on methods to blend into the surroundings. Initially highly classified and purportedly eradicated, the manual has now been declassified for public access. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others, as well as help for other issues such as domestic abuse, sex trafficking, crisis pregnancy, and more. Even help if you're struggling to get past a paranormal event that happened to you. That's the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. While there, you can also click on Tell Your Story to share your own true paranormal or creepy tale. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories used in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find links to the authors, stories, and sources I used in the episode description as well as on the website at WeirdDarkness.com. Weird Darkness is a registered trademark. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 10 verse 18 he who conceals his hatred has lying lips, and whoever spreads slander is a fool. And a final thought. If you're waiting for something or someone to bring you happiness, you're in for a lifetime of waiting. Chuck Swindoll I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human. Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, 
materials, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts.